arriving in U.S. mail from St. Louis in the original de Havilland DH-4 biplane and 10 bulky gunny sacks are the combined audiobook renditions and supplemental background information as presented in podcast form by moi, me, Robert P. Fitt. Good evening to one and all, wherever in the galaxy you make your home. Gentlemen, we must destroy Jim Garrison. I recognize this man as a member of the Intel community. Central Intelligence Agency. Why would Jim Garrison need to be destroyed? Because he had found the edge of the conspiracy to kill President Kennedy. You know this? Yes, I do. Do you know who killed President Kennedy? I honestly do not wish to talk about it. Well, let me clarify. I was told that Clay Shaw worked for CIA. Garrison would have unraveled the plot if he had that knowledge. And I can't comment on that. You were involved with an operation trying to stop the information from getting to Garrison. Now, I can't comment on that. Patch Kincaid was severely injured because of your actions. I know nothing of that. As far as Captain Kincaid, he knew the rest and whatever he volunteered for. He was formidable. What about Morocco, Gibraltar, France, and Great Britain? Classified. I can't talk about it. Did you ever think, Mr. Helms, and I do know you are Mr. Helms, that what you were doing came out of a small group of people with a narrow-minded point of view? I don't like traitors. I've had my fill of traitors, and we will take our traitors whenever ordered. You are the problem, Mr. Helms. Yeah, go to hell. So, CIA was as pure as the new fallen snow in attempting to thwart the garrison investigation. Ha ha ha. Take a look at this memo from FWM Jamie. Memorandum for the record, subject, the Garrison Group Meeting Number 1, 20 September 1967. Present, Executive Director, General Counsel, Inspector General, D slash P, D D slash S, Mr. Raymond Roker of the CI staff, Director of Security, and Mr. Goodwin. Number 1, Executive Director said that the Director had asked him to convene a group to consider the possible implications for the agency emanating from New Orleans before, during, and after the trial of Clay Shaw. General Counsel discussed his dealings with Justice and the desire of Shaw's lawyers to make contact with the agency. Roca felt that Garrison would indeed obtain a conviction of Shaw for conspiring to assassinate President Kennedy. Executive Director said the group should level on two objectives. A, what kind of action, if any, is available to the agency, and B, what actions should be taken inside the agency to reassure its director that we have the problem in focus. The possibility of the agency action should be examined from the timing of what can be done before the trial and what might be feasible during and after the trial. It was agreed that OGC and Royka will make a detailed study of all the facts and consult with justice as appropriate prior to the next meeting. F.W.M. Janey. As I have written before, Baker Finch was a metaphor for all the agency dirty tricks, illegalities, and assassinations. The garrison group, chaired by F.W.M. Janey, was a serious group of individuals who recommended direct action against Garrison and were willing to confer the defendant Clay Shaw's lawyers. Welcome to the third book in the Patch Kincaid narrative, American Injustice, Jim Garrison. I did not designate the third and fourth books as American Injustice because it was a catchy phrase. Egregious is the only word I can use to describe the result of the agency's actions during the two decades span from its inception in 1948. Conversely, the agency has protected the people of the United States from foreign threats. The agency is complex and diverse. To view it as one entity would not be accurate or fair. But there were those within the agency that had a parochial attitude to what they perceived as threats. It is how these threats, real or otherwise, were dealt with that has damaged the agency and the country. Patch enters the narrative in late 1966, and by early 1967, he becomes part of an ultra-secret network controlled by the elusive Denali. The mission is to get information to Garrison in the Garrison investigation, but those in power try to thwart his efforts. In the audiobook, I have melded the contemporary audio in 1967 in American Injustice, Jim Garrison. Just writing about the events of 1967 and 68 or quoting someone is not enough. 
Listening to the investigators around Garrison, as well as those who tried to destroy him, gives reality to those who were not yet born in the 1960s. Eventually working out of Louisiana, Patch and Mankiewicz commence operations against those who tried to take down Garrison. You can hear Mark Lane in 1967 debating David Bellin of the Warren Commission in a feisty exchange. The NBC white paper is linked in the Kindle editions, as is the Garrison response. Garrison's investigator, Gurevich, who betrayed Garrison, is in the audio. The Mafia did not like being prosecuted by Robert F. Kennedy during the Kennedy administration. They are still around, in and out of jail, during the Garrison investigation. How about Dean Andrews, the double-talking attorney who was asked by Clay Shaw to defend Lee Oswald? And the CIA plants in the investigation, including Perry Russo and the media itself, they all become part of the narrative. I thought Oswald did it. I would be remiss if I did not mention Lieutenant Natalie Tompkins, who falls in love with Patch, but Patch rebuffs her as he thinks he might have a chance to get back home to his wife and two boys. But don't worry, it's a long two books. Tompkins' boss is Commander Phineas Beauregard, who reports directly to Denali. And Dr. Mike Cameron is an important researcher as well as a doctor who treats Patch after a bloody encounter. Both Finney and Mike are off to Vietnam to interview a coordinator of the plot against JFK. And holding the book together is Ray Mankiewicz, physicist and time travel aficionado. Mankiewicz's abilities, both physical and mental, are tested in both novels as he and Patch attempt to front load Garrison's investigation with information. Many people would ask why the doors, especially Jim Morrison, have an undercurrent in this book that affects the future. It's because time travel is a risky venture. Robert P. Fitton. All of my books are available in paperback, Kindle, and audio at www.fittenbooks.com. You can listen to all my audio books on audible.com. Just type in Robert P. Fitton. Thank you and good night.